Hoffman. This is J.R. Moore coming to you live from deep in the mountains of the Missouri Ozarks. On Monday, the 23rd day of December, year of Lord 2019, welcome to the John Moore Show. We begin our shows with something that I believe should be said in every school, public and private, every day of the week. That would be the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Proper tip of the day, I want to encourage people to uh, celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus this week. Do that with friends and family, and remember the reason for the season, the birth of our Lord Jesus. No, he wasn't born on December 25th, but that's a big so what. They had to pick a day, and they picked a day. But uh, the main point is that he was born, and that he is our Lord. And that's your proper tip of the day. We have patient Wayne in the green room, my friend Sam Andrews. Sam is the proprietor of Freedom Center USA. The Facebook page is Freedom Center USA. And the telephone number is 417-718-2597. Good morning and Merry Christmas, Sam. Well, good morning, John. Merry Christmas to you. Well, thank you, sir. Um, well, we're into uh, winter now. This is the, uh, I think, the third day of winter, uh, and um, uh, things probably slow down a bit at Freedom Center, don't they? Well, I was hoping so, but actually, we had an amazing weekend. The sun was shining, and uh, we got a couple of rifles built. We got guys out shooting and testing loads. It was just beautiful this weekend, 55 and 60 degrees sunny on Saturday and Sunday, and boy, what a weekend. Well, anytime it's 55 and above, I'm ready to get on two wheels and ride my motorcycle. Well, we're anxiously waiting to hear what the uh, firearms tip of the week would be, sir. Well, the firearms tip of the week is to practice and train like you would fight. If you look at the environment that we live in today and the things that are happening, there are lots of different types of competitions out there that uh, they're good for new shooters to get into and to meet people and to work on some firearm skills. But I think we're quickly getting past this point where that's useful. And I think people really need to focus in on the skills that they need uh, for battle, and if you're not training the way you plan on fighting, uh, now might be a good time to start. Absolutely. Well, when I was in the Army Reserve, uh, that we had a phrase that um, would prove to be very true, uh, that they called it a come-as-you-are war. If there's a war that pops up all of a sudden, which typically that's what happens, whatever you got in terms of training and equipment and supplies, that's what you got. Uh, come as you are war, and uh, I believe the same principle holds true here, come as you are training. Whatever training you've got when hostilities begin, whether it's a home invasion or something of a larger magnitude, uh, whatever training you've got is what you have. You won't be going out and getting any more, not in, in, in the near term, would you? Yeah, in that situation, it's time to go. I mean, you don't have, you don't have, you're out of time, and so if you don't know how to slice a pie, if you don't know how to walk without the sights bouncing on your weapon system, if you don't know how to turn on your night vision or thermal and engage in the dark and identify targets in the dark, if you don't know how to shoot moving targets at close range and at far ranges, um, boy, you've got a short window of opportunity. Go get those skills. Don't wait. It's so doable. That's right. That's right. Well, this is your heads up, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have what appears to be the luxury of time between now and some kind of uh, massive civil disorder. And that, that may be a complete illusion, but the, the luxury of time appears to be what's happening right now, at least until the first week of November, which is less than 11 months away. Uh, people would be well advised to take advantage of this window to upgrade their training and, and equipment, wouldn't they? Sam. Yeah, now's the time to do it. You've got this small window of opportunity. I mean, if you've got a jet ski sitting in your garage you haven't taken to the lake in three years, sell that thing and get the stuff you need to survive. 
That might be a water tank. It might be ammo. It might be magazines. It might be some freeze-dried food. But learn to prioritize before the conflict starts. It will help you and your family tremendously after the conflict starts. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, people tend to have, and and that's a good point of jet skiing, but people tend to have and own things that uh, they have not used uh, in years. Uh, sitting, I call them dust collectors, and dust collectors can be uh, pretty pricey, can't they? Oh, the money that Americans spend on material objects <clears throat> that they use for a short time and then never use again. You know, we call we call all those gun collectors that have all these guns in the back of this safe they haven't pulled out in five years. We call those gun safe queens. That's right. Because they just they have this little throne in the back of the safe where they collect dust. And if you've got a dust queen or a safe queen, and you don't have a piston operated AR, or you don't have a piece of thermal, well, maybe you need to prioritize. You know, and right. and you know, I, I understand the well. My grandfather gave this to me. You know, when my grandfather on my father's side passed away, he gave me two things. He gave me a Browning 12-gauge Auto 5 shotgun that was his, and he gave me a piano. And uh, it was one of my most prized possessions. And I I, I understand the sentiment, but you're going to have to ask yourself a question one of these days. Do you care more about your grandchildren? Do you care more about your children? than you do a material object that your grandfather gave you? you care more about this country and its liberty and its freedom and this great experiment? Or do you care more about a material object that's collecting dust in your garage? Ask yourself the question and answer the question. I think you'll do the right thing. If you ask it and answer it honestly, uh, which is not easy, because there's, there's emotional components to this. It's not just pure logic. There's an emotional component to this, isn't it? Well, and, and what does Scripture say about the heart? The heart can be the most deceitful of all things. And so set your emotions aside, bring logic to the forefront, use the frontal lobe of your brain, and take a look at what's going on in this world and make the right decision. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this is Farmers Monday, ladies and gentlemen. And if you got a question or comment for Sam, Anything to do with rifles, shotguns, pistols, optics, ammunition, training, the gun culture, legislation, give us a call at 800-313-9443. Sam, I know you're monitoring what's going on in Virginia, as many of us in the alternative media are. I've come to the conclusion that the governor of uh, Virginia could give a tinker's damn about guns, about confiscating guns. I believe that his motivation, first of all, is to do what his handlers want him to do. But the real motivation, the real goal, is to get violent pushback. That's what they want. They don't give a damn about the guns. They want violent pushback. When you get into the western part of Virginia, into the mountains, it's a whole different culture. It's a whole different culture. I've spent some time there. There's, uh, in parts of the Appalachians, there's dialects of, Eng- dialects of English spoken that are very similar to Old English that haven't been spoken anywhere else on the planet for 200 years. These communities are very tight, uh, and they love their guns. They love their country. They love their constitution. And you, if you mess with it, you're on dangerous ground, aren't you, sir? Well, I, I think you're right, but I think, I think we need to go a layer deeper. It looks to me like the Virginia governor is trying to provoke a conflict. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so my my first question becomes, who benefits from a conflict and why? And if you want my take on it, I'd be happy to give it to you in the long segment. Please, please. Well, we're so far we're in agreement. I doubt we're going to disagree, but please proceed. <laughs> well, and I want I want to point I want to point to Jade Helm fifteen as an example. There's this lying, thieving nut job that runs an organization called the Oath Keepers, supposedly a group of patriots. And there's some good patriotic men in the Oath Keepers, but their leader, uh, Stuart Rhodes, is a criminal, and he's a liar. 
Let me tell you what happened during Jade Helm 15. Stuart Rhodes sent me an email and said, you need to write a letter for the Oath Keepers to publish that says uh, that they're going to take over eight states with Jade Helm 15 and they're going to confiscate people, gun, and install martial law. And, of course, I have friends in the military some of them were working on Jade Helm 15, and I knew that wasn't true. And I, I said to I said to Mr. Rhodes, I said, I'm not going to do that because it's not true. I said, I'll write you a letter, and I'll send it to you in an email that explains to you what Jade Helm 15 was. And Jade Helm 15 was a training exercise where the federal government had some software, some artificial intelligence, some com- some communication monitoring equipment. And they wanted to calibrate it. So they created this huge exercise so that they could monitor the behavior of people when provided certain stimulus and calibrate their equipment and monitor communications and monitor all these different things and then coordinate with federal agencies. And so they had these coordination tools, they had these AI tools, they had these classification tools, and the whole thing was a giant data gathering and calibration exercise. Now, if you want to know what I think about Virginia, I think they're probing the American people. I think they're they're going to go right up to the point of provoking a conflict and then back off, and they're going to monitor how conservative patriot groups and patriot counties, how they communicate, how they come together, how they form up their 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 groups, and I think it, and I think they're doing it in the home of the intelligence community, which is Virginia. And I think they're doing it there for a reason. And I think people need to understand who really benefits. Why Virginia? And when you, you ask that question and answer it, it's the easiest place for the intelligence community to take a state that has a, a large, populous, liberal city and a whole bunch of conservative counties, and to provoke a conflict, and then monitor how things happen so that they, when they try to take over for real, they've got a roadmap to how to defeat all of the mechanisms that the American patriots are going to use to defend freedom. I, I agree, and it's your uh, premise has merit. Your, your premise is certainly something that is very well likely going on. On one hand, on the other, uh, it's dangerous territory when you push people like they've been pushed, and uh, they may think they know when they can stop uh, their little exercise without it, it going hot. Uh, they may be wrong, though. They may very well be wrong. Um, you're right. Virginia is the heart of the intelligence community. The CIA has headquarters there at Langley, Virginia. Washington, D.C. is right at the edge of Virginia. And... Um, we shall see. We shall see how far they push these people, what the pushback is. If if what you're saying is true, then this is a test uh, on one hand. On the other, at some point, the testing will be over and it will go live and go hot. And quite frankly, I don't know if this is just a test as you state, which I hope it is, or if they decide to go ahead and go hot and go live. And how can we tell the difference, Sam, before it actually happens? Well, it may not be either or scenario, John. It may be both. They may be seeing how far they can push and what they can get away with and then monitoring the pushback to do this in other states. So it may be both. It may not be an either or situation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I've been reaching out to people. uh, Last week, Sam, I was reaching out to Virginia residents to give us updates of, and all you folks in Virginia, if you want to call in and give us an update of what's going on in your county, in your city in Virginia, concerning uh, the governor and his anti-gun laws, give us a call at 800-313-9443. One of the sheriffs in one of those counties, Sam, has stated publicly that he will deputize hundreds of his residents uh, to be deputy sheriffs if these laws are passed. And he had a big smile on his face when he was doing it. Well, I think, I think that a lot of these Democrat politicians, they're not really aware of the Karachi rule of asymmetrical warfare. 
and they're about to become aware of it. Uh, you know, I just I can't imagine this going a whole lot further, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. We sure live in interesting times. Uh, no doubt we live in interesting times. No doubt. Uh, people all over the country, uh, in the alternative media, and in conservative circles, Christian circles, are watching very carefully what's happening in Virginia. Watching it very carefully. Uh, it's not just you and I, Sam. It's tens of thousands of Americans all over this country, possibly millions, that are watching the uh, events in, in Virginia and prognosticating, thinking, wondering, what would we do in our state if a similar situation came up? And they have to be thinking that, right, Sam? Well, let me tell you something. Just from the activity that I've monitored on Facebook alone, there are hundreds of thousands of men that are now posting memes about the Bujahadeen, or Bujahadeen. Now, that is a play on words, and it is, uh, it is a play on the Muj, or the Mujahideen, in Afghanistan back in the 80s. And what's interesting is these men have taken this word and, and twisted it around, and they're talking about the next revolution in the United States, and they call it the Bujahideen. And they're, they're talking about a, a, a revolutionary war kicking off and Amer armed Americans getting rid of these criminals in Washington, D.C. And uh, they sure are pushing a lot of buttons trying to get us there in a hurry. It's pretty amazing to watch. It is. It is. It is pretty amazing. Well, I, I have to compliment the uh, sheriffs and the chiefs of police and the Second Amendment Sanctuary City. Uh, they understand our Constitution, they understand the law, and they're doing the right things for the right reasons. we got to call her and hold, we got to break, we'll be right back. Tired of being lied to by mass media? It's growing more and more apparent today that news is received less and less through standard media outlets. Even with a growing audience every day, RBN is beginning to direct more efforts into social media. Social media and the use of the Internet is fast becoming the primary source of people for news, regardless of demographic. RBN has set out to provide some of the best news on the Internet through republicbroadcasting.org and also has begun to use the tools to our advantage by way of social media. Republic Broadcasting is now operating a Facebook page to function as yet another avenue to have our collective voice reach new audiences across not only America, but across the globe as well. The Facebook page features not only news, but also an RBN player to listen to our broadcast. Get involved by visiting Facebook.com slash Republic Broadcasting and liking our page and share it with your friends and family because you can handle the truth. It's officially winter, and I know where I'll be the second week of February. I'll be on a Caribbean cruise. You want to join me? You want to join Leon Green and I? Well, details are at my website at thelibertyman.com. Give our cruise director a call, Betsy Murphy. I'll be seeing Betsy later today, her and her husband. Betsy Murphy, our cruise director. Her telephone number is 636-530-9502. I say again, 636-530-9502. This is Farmers Monday. We're visiting with Sam Andrews, the proprietor of Freedom Center USA. The Facebook page is Freedom Center USA. The telephone is 417-718-2597. Sam, we got a caller and holder. we got Chris in Missouri. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, John. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. Go ahead. Um... I just wanted to let you know, uh, you said December the 25th is not our Lord's birthday, but on 
we have the Feast of the Circumcision eight days after. They held the Feast of the Circumcision before they held our Lord's birthday. So that way you know exactly when it is. Okay. I just wanted to clear that up because a lot of people always say that's not when our Lord was born, but that is, that's actually when he was born. Okay, well, Dave, I don't want to get into theology this think, morning. Sam, you got some follow-up on that? Well, I just have a question for our caller. What day do you believe Jesus was born? December the 25th. You believe he was born December the 25th? Yes. We, you know there's a lot of uh, PhDs that have studied this that are Christian men, uh, guys like N.T. Wright, Tom Wright, um, who believe that Jesus was born in the late spring, early summer, based on the edict of the king to uh, come and uh, be part of a census and the timing of that census. And so I think there's some disagreement among the experts um, I also think that the holiday of Christmas is something that was woven into Christianity. It was a combination of a pagan ritual and a uh, and a Christian ritual, and there was a lot of that going on. Same thing with Easter. You know, if you know who Eshtar is, who the word Easter is named after, there's nothing Christian about that. That was a Far East fertility celebration. So I would encourage every person out there to do your own research don't get angry about it. Don't get upset about it. There's a chance you've been lied to most of your life or that some of this information you've been taught isn't correct, but you can do your own research and make your own decision on that stuff. To me, oh. the birth of Christ and, and Easter, the, the act of the atonement, I don't tie either of those to a date. Um, Christ is who God made him to be, and... Uh, we need to accept him uh, as a priestly king according to Melchizedek because that's how Scripture describes him. And uh, if if you read your Bible and you make your own decision, you'll do fine. I'm not worried about it. Okay. Chris, we appreciate your call. Thank you, sir. Thank you very um, much, and Merry Christmas. Okay. Thank you, sir. Merry Christmas, um, guys. Take care. Yeah. People can get really caught up in nuances that are... Uh, Interesting to look at, but uh, in the bigger picture, in the bigger scheme of things, really aren't all that relevant. And I agree with you, Sam. People need to do their own research, reach their own conclusions. The main point being, we celebrate the birth of our Lord Jesus, and uh, the specific day. Quite frankly, I don't care. You know, we picked a day, and it's a great day, and that's enough. Um, Sam, uh, uh, the uh, when, that day, that uh, weekend I spent with you a couple of weeks ago uh, at the um, entry-level precision marksmanship class, I learned so much. And we have, this being radio, we have new listeners every week, people who don't know who John Moore is, never heard Sam Andrews before. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, some of you know my bio pretty well, but when it comes to firearms, I began shooting rifles while... Uh, we had a five-star general for president, that would be President Eisenhower, when I commenced my firearms training. I, I scored expert in the U.S. Army uh, with my M16, um, marksman with my M14. I'm an NRA certified firearms instructor. I have competed, not very much, but I have competed in, in long-range rifle competition. With all that said, with all that said, I learned more of the first half hour in that class a few weeks ago than I did the past half century. So that was my heads up that uh, I had a lot, of, a lot of learning to do. I have a lot of practice to do. And most men, uh, now, and also going into that class, I could routinely set up a dime, a half-inch diameter target at 100 yards and hit it three times out of five, hit a quarter five times out of five, with, with the marksmanship skills I had going into the class. Coming out of the class, I knew I had to redo everything so that I could even improve my skill sets even better. I'm saying all this because, gentlemen and ladies, you're probably not as good as you think you are. What do you think, Sam? Well, a lot of people get comfortable hunting. You know, and, and in Missouri, for example, in eastern deciduous forest, most of your hunting shots are inside 200 yards unless you're hunting over a, 
cut bean field or a power line cut. So, right. you know, the, the skills are adequate for what you use them for, but when we get into a conflict, they may not be adequate. That's right. We got a break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned, everybody. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Jerry Moore here on... Monday. It is Monday, the 23rd of December. My website is thelibertyman.com. Probably some discretionary time between now and New Year's. Some time to check out some of the articles and video, videos at my website and possibly stop procrastinating about dealing with the arthritis pain and get yourself an energy cleaner and a mattress pad to go with it. Details at my website at thelibertyman.com. I'm going to place an order for a, a energy cleaner, a mattress pad. Just call my toll-free order line. They take calls eight, uh, 24 hours a day at 800-592-9543. Building with Sam Andrews, the proprietor of Freedom Center USA. This is Firearms Monday. The telephone number down there in beautiful Lebanon, Missouri, and it's truly beautiful, beautiful community. 417-718-2597. Well, Sam, in, in the circles that you and I travel, it's going to be some uh, happy men and women and boys and girls getting new firearms uh, in a couple of days, right? Absolutely. You know, there'll be, a, there'll be a lot of gifts in that realm, and I think there's probably over 80 million gun owners now. I think the largest demographic growing in gun ownership are women, adult women. So, uh, you know, hopefully if your woman doesn't have a concealed carry 9mm uh, or a revolver, if she doesn't have the finger strength to clear a nine mil quickly, then uh, that's a great thing. You should get her one for Christmas. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of uh, tales about firearms and how powerful they are and who can handle what. And the story I like to tell, and I've told them in the air many, many times, Sam, I was at the Vietnamese National Police Pistol Range doing some training myself when a Vietnamese officer showed up with his wife. His wife was probably maybe four foot ten, maybe ninety pounds, ninety five pounds. And she picked up and handled a forty five uh, caliber semi automatic pistol very professionally and was putting that lead down range and hitting the silhouette. And uh, uh, point being, a petite woman giving proper training and proper motivation can handle a full size, full power pistol, can't she? Well they absolutely can. If you go on YouTube and you do a search for Jesse Abate or Tori Tanaka, these are not large, strong women. These are thin, in shape uh, young gals, and watch them run their pistols. It is something to behold. These are competitive shooters, but you do not have to be big and strong to run a pistol well. And if you watch Tori Tanaka or Jesse Abate or Jesse Duff. I think she's remarried a few times, so her name's changed. But you'll find her and watch these girls run pistols, rifles, and shotguns. You will be stunned at the skill level. That would be great. I, I, I would love to see that myself. And um, I'm always looking to see um, women with showing competence and, and using firearms. Uh, it's, it's great. And it's, and it's encouraging for women to watch that and and not be uh, talk themselves out of something because they are petite. Uh, that, that's not necessary, is it? No, you know, my wife and I got to meet Tori Tanaka at the SHOT Show, and I saw her sitting behind a booth at the SHOT Show uh, behind this table, and she had her, her beautiful sponsor shirt on that was all colorful that she competes in to advertise for her sponsors. And I said to my wife, I said, there's Tori. You should go get her autograph. And she said, who's Tori? I said, go get an autograph picture, and then I'll show you who Tori is. We'll watch her on YouTube. And, and she went over and got an autograph picture from Tori. And then my wife got on YouTube and saw her shoot and was just like, 
wow, she is amazing. And I said, yeah, she really is. She's good. Tori Tanaka. Right? Yeah. T-O-R-I. T-A-N. A-K-A. She's she's of Japanese descent, and uh, she's she's a small small little girl. I mean, I mean, she's a woman, grown woman. Don't get me wrong, but I mean, she, this is not a big imposing linebacker of the NFL. Let me tell you. <laughs> okay. You watch her, you watch her shoot and move. I mean, it's a beautiful, graceful, very quick, very proficient thing, and I think. A lot of men that think they're good with their handguns would be embarrassed, if not shamed, to watch Jesse or Tori shoot their handguns and their AR-15s in competition. Uh, guys, I, yeah, I'm looking at it. Uh, her last name is November Oscar November Alpha Kilo Alpha Nonaka, and she's got a big smile on her face. <laughs> She's been at this a while. Here she is, the Pro Am competition uh, ten years ago. Um, she's been at this a while, hasn't she? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we've got the same person, but uh, um, I'll have to look it up to be sure. But uh, let me tell you, you watch these gals compete. They put a little time in, and uh, they can flat embarrass a guy with a handgun. It's something to watch. Absolutely. Well, it's. I'm sure. I mean, how many female competitors at that level can there be with that with that type of name? Um, T O R I Nonaka, um, and she's on top of it. She's very competent shooting here at the Pro Am uh, tournament. It looks. I can't tell what pistol it is other than being semi-automatic, and it's purple. <laughs> um, well, that's good news. And, and ladies, uh, arm yourselves. Now, uh, back before we had concealed carry training uh, permits in Missouri, uh, Sama, I did uh, complimentary concealed carry training. Uh, I, w- I wasn't going to charge people any money since there was no permits in Missouri yet. At that time, about half my students were female, and almost all of them had been uh, victims of uh, violent criminal acts. And law be damned, they were going to get the pistol, get to training, and never, ever be a victim of violence again. That was their attitude, and I complimented them on that. And law be damned, they were going to be safe and not be a victim of crime ever again. Well, that's the thing. You have to make the resolve. Everything that you do that improves your security, everything you do that improves the security of your family, it all starts with something inside your heart changing. You've got to have a different motivation. You've got to do something differently. You, you've got to uh, you, you've got to be willing to change. You've got to be willing to take a different viewpoint, to accept new information, to practice in a different way. It's the change that allows you to grow. And if you have a continuous improvement mindset, uh, then you can make this sort of thing happen. It's it's not hard. It's not difficult. But you have to be willing to change, and that change is sometimes the hardest thing we do as human beings. Absolutely, absolutely. We we develop habits. People are tend to be creatures of habit. Uh, we develop attitudes that are difficult to change, beliefs that are difficult to change, and uh, people who can do that, who have the capability of rethinking something looking at something with new eyes, as the, as the old saying would go, and then make a change based on new input and new beliefs. Now, they're the ones that move forward, aren't they? Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I, we've talked about uh, this book about modern warfare, the five battles that change the face of modern warfare. But, you know, the interesting thing about that book isn't the battles. The interesting thing is the political decisions that were made two, three, and four years before the battles, these famous battles, that really determined who won and who lost. It really is a preparation game. And if you want to survive, the way to do it is to prepare properly to make wise choices on equipment and ammo and on how you train. And, you know, do you have uh, canned and jarred food as a bug-in strategy? 
do you have freeze-dried food so you can take enough food with you if you have to vacate the spot that you're in because it gets too hot? I mean, that's that's the, these are the decisions and the type of preparation that you do will either buy you flexibility or it will lock you into one strategy. Right, and right. Uh, you better you the right strategy if that happens. God help you, you know. Well, there's an excellent example in World War II of uh, a country spending millions of francs, as it turned out, to prepare to fight World War I all over again. That would be France. They spent tens of millions of francs preparing to fight World War I all over again. What they didn't realize is that Germany wasn't going to fight World War I over again. And the tens of millions of francs they spent uh, to have an excellent defense to fight World War I all over again was all for naught, wasn't it? Exactly. And there's a number of political organizations, the heads of government, that have made that type of mistake historically. I mean, France isn't the only one that one wanted to gear up to fight the last war. I mean, there's a lot of examples in history of those types of decisions being made. Well, let me tell you something. Um, the Internet and the, the major news media, they're not going to televise this next war. Your normal communication uh, sources are not going to function, and they're not going to give you accurate information. At best, they'll give you misinformation to try and mislead you. And so you need to have communications equipment. You need to have your own water source. You need to have food supplies set aside. You need to be able to identify targets and engage in the dark. That's the face of modern warfare. Absolutely. Absolutely. Another World War II example, um, a lance is a 10-foot wood pole with a metal spear tip on the end of it. That's what a lance is. The uh, Polish cavalry, mounted cavalry, uh, sent men into battle with lances against German tanks. Uh, they were ready to fight uh, the Crusades all over again. Uh, that didn't work out too well, did it? No, that's a failed strategy from the word go. Well, ladies and gentlemen, how's that translating into 2019? Uh, listen, pay heed to what Sam is saying. Uh, half of just about half of every day, and we just had the uh, shortest day of the year th three days ago. Half, about half of every day is nighttime, and of course, bad things will happen at night. Will the ambient night uh, light we're used to in the city be present? It's never really dark in the city. You can always see something. But when that ambient light's gone, it really, really gets dark, doesn't it, Sam? Absolutely. And you got to start somewhere. So pick something and get going. You know, this the, the forces that are trying to destroy America are large. They're threatening. They're real. This isn't projection. It isn't, it isn't uh, paranoia. The stuff that's going on is real. The, the gun confiscation strategies in Virginia, the desire for the globalists and the collectivists is to apply this to every state in the United States. Remember that, and I've said this before, the strategy is population reduction. The American gun owner is in their way. And if you, it's, not their gun, it's not your guns that they want. They want you dead. They want you off their planet. And the American gun owners preventing them from doing that. And we really, really need to call a spade a spade, a look at what we're actually dealing with, and get ready because uh, there's a lot of people in this country that aren't going to give up freedom and our way of life to a bunch of communists slash collectivists. It's just not going to happen the way they think it is. No, no. Uh what the uh, communist collectivists think is that uh, American men and women who are wearing a badge will follow orders and go to door, door to door and seize people's firearms. There probably would be some to do that, but most aren't going to do that, which leaves them bring with no alternative except to bring in UN troops to do their bidding, correct? Well, I think if a politician can get the state police or the local sheriff to do their dirty work for them, they'll do that. But I think that uh, it would be a huge mistake to bring in U.N. troops. Can you imagine the response of the American people 
<laughs> Remember what happened at Bundy Ranch? Uh, they tried to take this guy's ranch and his cattle, and 2,500 patriots showed up to tell these criminals at the federal government to go pound sand. Can you imagine if they started confiscating guns in multiple counties in Virginia, the number of firearms owners that would rush to the state of Virginia alone just to put a stop to this, it would be something to behold. I think I think it'd be a great education. But you know, if this sort of thing happens, um, I'm afraid that nobody's going to fire a shot. There's just going to be a bunch of uh, liberal Democrats hanging from trees. You know that's that that could happen. Nobody will waste a round of ammo on them. They'll just they'll just go get them and hang them from trees. You know, with some cheap Chinese rope. Uh, I know for decades that uh, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the uh, Highway Patrol in various states, the FBI, have infiltrated various patriot groups, uh, World War II reenactors, Civil War reenactors, um, and so forth, attempting to find. Any uh, propensity for violence, any propensity for Ill, Ill activity, and, and never finding any on one hand. On the other, these are organized groups. The Civil War reenactors, North and South, the uh, World War II reenactors, Vietnam reenactors, uh, Revolutionary War reenactors. These are trained men who were armed with a chain of command, used to military style discipline, used to being out in the bush and sleeping on the ground at night. Uh, used to uh, silent movement and so forth, using tactics appropriate for whatever uh, warfare that they're reenacting. Uh, I think there's a high likelihood that groups like that would come together and uh, become a real militia instead of reenactors. What do you think, sir? Oh, I think it's possible, but I'll tell you what, it's probably not even going to be necessary. Let's just take Virginia, for example. You've got 80 to 90 counties that have expressed in a resolution that, that, that they want to be a Second Amendment sanctuary county. Well, it's different than Missouri because Missouri, you're a political subdivision of the state. You don't have the autonomy that the counties do in Virginia. So it's a little bit different structure. But here's what happens in the real world. You've got these counties that desire to be sanctuary counties, and the governor makes a move and gets aggressive, well, guess what? Guess what happens next? All of these sheriff's departments have mutual aid agreements with the counties in the surrounding areas. And there's very few counties that don't have at least two other counties bordering them. That's right. We have a break. We'll be right back. Tired of being lied to by mass media? It's growing more and more apparent today that news is received less and less through standard media outlets. Even with a growing audience every day, RBN is beginning to direct more efforts into social media. Social media and the use of the Internet is fast becoming the primary source of people for news, regardless of demographic. RBN has set out to provide some of the best news on the Internet through republicbroadcasting.org and also has begun to use the tools to our advantage by way of social media. Public Broadcasting is now operating a Facebook page to function as yet another avenue to have our collective voice reach new audiences across not only America, but across the globe as well. The Facebook page features not only news, but also an RBN player to listen to our broadcast. Get involved by visiting Facebook.com slash Republic Broadcasting and liking our page and share it with your friends and family, because you can handle the truth. Broadcasting on Monday the 23rd. So I'm visiting with Sam Andrews, the proprietor of Freedom Center USA. 
a telephone on there if you, if you need to sign up for a class uh, and have some farms work done, give him a call at 417-718-2597. So, Sam, I assume we're, we're past the fall rush for these um, uh, deer hunters who um, wait till the last minute to get their rifles uh, fixed, and it's on the more normal uh, activity now when it comes to rifle repair? Okay. Yes, we have we have a reloading class coming up on January 5th, that's Sunday around 12 noon, and uh, we've, we've had a number of requests for a moving target workshop, and we haven't picked a date for that, but it's like a, it's a six-hour workshop where we do 45 minutes of training on how to shoot movers, and then we let guys practice for five hours shooting moving targets. And see, that's the thing that nobody's doing in their training. They're not spending a large amount of time shooting moving targets. And in the real world, in a battle situation, targets don't hold still. You need to know how to shoot a walking target. You need to know how to shoot a running target. And you need to be able to do it at different ranges, and the lead changes as the range extends. And so we're going to do a mover workshop, and uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. I think that... From my experience, guys enjoy shooting moving targets at long range more than just about anything they do. That reminds me of a story I've, I've told a few times. Uh, the incredibly uh, well-known TV newsman, Walter Cronkite, during the Vietnam War, ran a segment where uh, the uh, U.S. Army uh, were, was making fun of the Viet Cong because they didn't know how to lead a helicopter to shoot it down. Within a few days... The Viet Cong were leading helicopters and shooting them down. Um, but um, you're right. Uh, almost nobody practices, this except maybe casual plinking, where you may have a, uh, some moving targets uh, at 25 yards or so. You're shooting with a 22 long rifle. But, but for shooting moving targets with a centerfire rifle at uh, 100 yards or more, that's almost never done, is it? You know, unfortunately, it's it's a little bit more difficult to practice. You know, a lot of gun owners are independent guys. They they go to the range by themselves, or maybe they take their son or their daughter or their wife to shoot. Uh, but it's 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 an independent activity in a lot of ways. And if you go to the range by yourself, and you don't go to this really high end range that has moving targets available, it's pretty hard to practice. Because there's there's not there's no machines to run movers, there's nobody to walk or run movers for you behind the berms. It's just a difficult thing to practice by yourself. So I think it's a good idea to get together with a range and to get uh, to a range that can shoot movers at different distances and get those leads worked out and get some good practice in. Absolutely, and once again, time's a waste. Uh, I don't know that anything's going to happen uh, during or after the first week of November this year, uh, this coming year, 2020. But I'm kind of very concerned about it. we got a top of our break. We'll be right back. We're back, ladies and gentlemen. Jaron Moore here, our second hour on Monday, the 23rd day of December, here at Republic Broadcasting. This is Farms Monday, visiting with Sam Andrews, the proprietor of Freedom Center USA. The telephone number down there is 417-718-2597. Well, Sam, I, I definitely want to be at that reloading class that you've got. It uh, will be the first Sunday in January. Yes, sir. It should okay. be January 5th. Okay. And, and it's from what time to what time again? Uh, we'll run about 12.30 to 4.30. You probably want to get there around noon. Okay. Sounds good. And... Uh, you don't have a snack bar there, so people need to bring their own lunch uh, or eat before they get there, right? Yeah, we won't be we won't be taking a lot of breaks. You want to eat lunch before you get there and be ready to take notes because we'll get we'll get after it right at twelve thirty and get into the technical side of loading ammunition capable of shooting sub two inch groups at a thousand yards. Sub two inch groups at a thousand yards. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. It wasn't so long ago that that was thought to be almost impossible, except for the uh, bench rush shooters at, at very high levels, wasn't it? 
Yeah, we now have semi-auto systems that shoot sub three inches at at a thousand yards with good ammo. And I have a feeling if we get out there on a real calm day, they'll go under two inches with those same weapon systems. Amazing, absolutely amazing. Well, if you want to learn how to reload, just give Sam a call. Sign up for the reloading class. I, I do expect to be there. Uh, uh, I don't know if, uh, if I have any conflicts yet, or if there's going to be a snowstorm. I'm obviously not going to go there. There, go there, but um, I do want to be there, and I'm making plans to do so. If you want to be in a reloading class, give them a call at four one seven seven one eight two five nine seven. Now, give us a summary of what people are going to learn when they in this class, Sam. You're going to learn what to do with the brass. You're going to learn what types of dies load straighter ammo. We're going to show you what type of machines we use to measure how true the ammo is loaded. You're going to see some really high-end scales that load ammo really fast. You're going, to, you're going to basically learn to use different tools and better tools to load more precise, more concentric ammo that's more consistent. So typically, a store-bought box of ammo will vary between 65 and 130 feet per second in velocity. That's the kind of variance you'll get in a 20-round box. With our techniques, we can load ammunition plus or minus about 2 feet per second. Plus or minus 2 feet per second? That's phenomenal. Yeah, we get guys with extreme spreads under 4 feet a second all the time. And there's specific things that you do. It's not complicated, but you do have to have the right tools. You do have to have good brass, and you do have to have a good lot of primers to do that sort of thing. You're dependent on certain manufacturers to do their job, and you you have to have the right equipment. Now, the good news is we have way better equipment now than we had even 10 years ago. We have better scales. We have better brass. We have way better bullets. We have better firing pins, and, and there's all kinds of things that we do differently now than we did even 10 years ago. Added together, they make a tremendous difference in the accuracy of the weapon system. There's a lot that goes into this, and if you want to be, be dealing with experts and professional men who really know what they're doing, you need to get the Freedom Center USA and get the real deal. And... Uh, these are skills that uh, once you learn these skills, you could pass them on to others, couldn't you? That's the whole premise of the Freedom Center, is to train people so well that they can pass these skills down to their children and grandchildren. That is the point. That's why we exist. That's good to know. And it's part of your overall mission statement, isn't it? It is part of our mission statement. It's the most important part of our mission statement. And we, you know, we really um, are dedicated to, to getting information out there and to getting people doing the right things that work and that allow us to defend freedom as a community. It's no small thing. It is no small thing. It's the foundation of our republic that men and women have these skills so that uh, our republic will continue for decades, or even centuries into the future, correct, Sam? Yeah, and let's be clear. We're not teaching people to be aggressive. We're teaching people to have skills and be a deterrent. The best way to avoid conflict is to not have conflict. And when you've got a whole society that's a deterrent to conflict, you've got a great situation and a peaceful life, and so do your children and grandchildren. That's been the attitude of the... Uh, inhabitants of Switzerland for a couple of centuries now. Little Switzerland, surrounded uh, by two of the most brutal wars in, in, in human history, and they remained at peaks where every able-bodied male between 18 and 60 years old was part of their militia, part of their home guard, and nobody wanted to mess with Switzerland, did they? No, they're required to train on a regular basis. They're required to have a minimum of 500 rounds of ammunition ready and available to defend their communities. It's a different culture than it is here, and it's, it's expected of you. 
Well, it, they have a relatively low homicide rate, and pretty much every home in Switzerland has a machine gun. <laughs> it's required. If you're a That's citizen, right. you're armed, and you're ready to defend your country. It's it's expected in the culture. It's mandatory. They're not asking. So, uh, by translation, if every home in Chicago had a machine gun, would they be as safe as Switzerland? Uh, not initially, because you have some moral corruption issues in Chicago. But uh, eventually, things would sort themselves out if there's more good people than bad people. That's a good. It's a good assessment there, Sam. I like that. I like that. Well. My liberal friends, when, when I, uh, I advocate the Second Amendment, uh, they'll say something off the, off the cuff. And I've had several say this. You mean, John, you think everybody should have a bazooka? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's pretty funny. And, of course, they don't know that a, a 3.5-inch rocket launcher has not been used by the U.S. military since Vietnam. And you know, even that was one of the Marines that used them. The Marines are, are known for using up old inventory, aren't they? Well, you know, when people make these insane comments, they're just expanding and using extremist rhetoric to try and put people off of a of a certain way of life. And you know what? If you don't want to own a gun, that's great because the people with guns defend your right to choose and not to own a gun. So good for you. But, you know, um, if you're not man enough to pick up a rifle and defend your community, your family, or your country, and you're not man enough to train with one, I wouldn't even call yourself a man. To be honest, you should be celebrating Mother's Day when Father, you know, when the rest of us will be celebrating Father's Day. Well, I agree completely. I agree. And we're raising up a generation of males who don't have the traditional values and fortitude of American men, aren't we? Well, we're not raising them up. They're being raised by women because the family courts have taken the fathers out of the home and out of their children's lives. And that's a, that's a different topic for a different show. But if you want to know why we have a bunch of soy boys and metrosexuals running around this country, it's because they're not raised by men anymore. And if you're a woman, you can't raise a boy to be a man. You can try. You can try and raise him with a moral framework. But the only person that can teach a young boy how to be a man is another man. Very true. Very true. We got a caller on hold here. We got Hendrix in Mississippi. Good morning, Hendrix. Good morning. How's everyone? Really good. I just want to, to, to call in and wish you a Merry Christmas, first of all. Uh, going back to what you was talking about in the important top of the hour break, uh, one thing I try to do when I'm by myself, like today it's rainy, it's cold, it's windy, I'm still going to go out and practice because, as Sam alluded to earlier, and you talk about it all the time too, John, uh, Conditions are always ideal, so you need to get out in weather that's not always ideal and practice uh, if it's too hot, too cold. If you put that rifle up to your cheek or your hand, using your handgun when it's hot or cold, it has a different feeling to it. you got to adjust to that, and at least that's my opinion. But as always, appreciate y'all. Again, Merry Christmas to you and, uh, and uh, John Moore Nation out there, and okay. God bless you. Thank you, Anderson. We appreciate the call. Merry Christmas to you and your family, sir. Our next caller is taking a break from feeding his goats. That would be Jerry in Texas. Good morning, Jerry. Good morning, Sam and John. Uh, yeah, uh, you're talking about Switzerland. It's been oh, it's probably 20 years ago. No, it's been longer than that, probably 30. That, that little parade uh, insert that used to be in the Sunday paper. And Lucia says good morning, too. Uh they, uh, I can't get away from them. Uh, there was an article uh, uh, that was written in Switzerland. This old farmer, uh, he had this uh, barn, and uh, uh, he uh, took his reporter around to the side of it, and there's a door that slid open. He slid open and slid open, and there was an anti-aircraft gun sitting there, with uh, and then had racks of. Uh, uh, ammo off to the side, and uh, he, was, he was up in the mountains, and there, there was a pretty good article about that. He was uh, he was retired, but they uh, he still had that anti aircraft gun there. And uh, if uh, they were called up, they were uh, some uh, 
personnel would come up there and operate that uh, gun. But uh, so, yeah, it's not just uh, rifles and handguns. Uh, there's some major uh, infrastructure there that they had, uh, they put in place. I don't know if they're still like that or not today, but uh, that come to mind on that. Uh, Sam, are you familiar with that little survival uh, rifle, shotgun that uh, uh, TPS Arms has uh, started manufacturing the M6. It's uh, a little carbine shotgun over uh, over and under. 410 shotgun, and you can get this little, uh, it's a little takedown uh, uh, gun. At, uh, it's 17 HMR, 22 long rifle, 22 magnum, and 22 hornet. I have, I have not tested one of those. I, I don't know anything about it. Well, it's patterned after that, uh, that Springfield M6 that uh, uh, used to be manufactured. A friend of mine come across that uh, over the weekend, and he was telling me about it. He, uh, uh, well, he, he used to be a gunsmith. He does some for himself, but he went to gunsmithing school up there in Colorado. Uh, many years ago, and uh, but he said uh, he had a Springfield 22 Hornet uh, 410. He said of all the guns that I ever got rid of, he said that was the one I I uh, regret the most. But uh, something that uh, you might, uh, if you got time, look at it and see if that's a good recommendation for people to have. It breaks down into about, uh, what, a barrel is 18 and a quarter inches, or barrels. And, uh, and of course, you've got uh, part of the action uh, where you got the breech, but it actually breaks down and folds under, so it gets really compact. And then it's got yes, uh, in the stock. The stock has that got... Uh, really, really effective for food gathering if you're on the move. That sounds like a really handy thing to put in a backpack. Yeah, you know, it's, it's stock, you've got, they've got uh, slots where you can put, uh, uh, you know, uh, carry uh, your ammo, the uh, 410 shells, and whatever your little uh, uh, rifle uh, ammo is. And uh, I would, price don't seem to be too shabby on it. Uh, gun brokers has got the uh, 22 Hornet, which I would have if I if I get one, because it's reloadable and you can reload load whatever uh, ammo you want for whatever. I guess you go deer hunting with it. You got it hot, uh, hot enough that uh, you know headshot. Uh, you can bring down a pretty good sized animal with it, and I guess that brass would last forever, as long as you've got primers and powder and the bullets. But uh, anyway, I just thought I'd mention that and get a chance. And uh, hey, y'all have uh, a good uh, and safe Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year. And folks, don't forget to pray for our Republic and our President and all rulers. Pray that we can live, continue to live a quiet and peaceful life. And with that, I uh, thank you, John, for taking my okay. call. Thank you, John. We appreciate the call. Call number is 800-313-9443. Sam, this is a time where people reflect on their life as they've lived it and reflect on what they would like, life would like to be uh, in the coming year. Uh, people make what's called resolutions, and uh, some of which are kept, some of which aren't. But we're, we want to encourage people to make a resolution to improve their marksmanship and, and fire proficiency, don't we, sir? Yeah, whatever's holding you back, let it go. You know, cast the chains aside and run the race that's set before you. And, and it's not a bad thing to have a little more skill and a few more tools in your toolbox. It just takes a little time and a little effort. That's right. That's right. A little more time, a little more effort, and... Uh, the hardest step is taking that first step. Once you take the first step moving forward, whatever it might be, taking that first class at Freedom Center, learning how to reload, making a decision that you're going to become uh, better 
and actually doing something, get, getting past the point of it being a thought and taking some concrete action. That's what's necessary, isn't it? It sure is. You know, you have to take the action steps. You can't just think about it. And that's where a lot of a lot of men and women stop. They, they think, "Boy, well, I would like to be a better shot, or I would like to be uh, have a, the uh, ability to reload ammunition." Maybe they even buy some of the equipment, and it just sits in the box. If it sits in the box, it doesn't accomplish the goal, does it? No, you've got to you've got to get out and practice. You know, we'll talk after the break, but I'd like to get into that a little bit. Let's do that. We got a break. We'll be right back. It is Monday, the 23rd of December here at Republic Broadcasting. We are going on a cruise. What a great time to be away from the cold, the snow, the ice, and so forth. The second week of February, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, the John Moore Patriot Symposium Cruise. Details at my website at thelibertyman.com. There's still some cabins available, I was told, by our cruise director, Betsy Murphy. If you want to go, give Betsy a call. You can join Leanne and I on this cruise. Betsy Murphy, our, our cruise director, 636-530-9502. Building with Sam Andrews, the proprietor of Freedom Center USA, the Facebook page is Freedom Center USA. The telephone number down there is 417-718-2597. Well, Sam, you're prepared to help anybody, whether they're entry level, just getting started, or whether they're a world-class uh, uh, sniper and everybody in between, right? Absolutely. We've got training programs that can help you at any level. We can make you better. And, you know, to be honest, when when we watch the beginning shooters and, and we observe them and try and figure out what's holding them up from being proficient and being fast and being accurate, we notice that they don't have a routine. And so there's a lot of thought that goes into, okay, how do I put my bipod down? How do I get comfortable? How do I get this bag situated under the rifle? You know, how do I do these different things before I take the shot? And it takes forever. It's like watching paint dry. You come to the Freedom Center, we're going to get rid of all of those questions, get rid of all of that anxiety, we're going to get rid of all of that, and we're going to give you a methodology that's simple and fast and accurate. And that's what you really want. You want to be able to get that firearm into play right now and make it effective. Nothing holding you back, nothing slowing you down. Get in the fight and stay in the fight and keep that gun running. And those are the things in our training, the type of things that we focus on. Absolutely. Now, there was something before the break you wanted to get into in more detail, sir? Well, and that, that was that was it. That we've got we've got to get to the point where we can pick up a firearm and be effective with it right now. You know, one of the interesting things that Major General Hollingsworth taught me uh, about boot camp in the Marine Corps, he said we teach our recruits two things predominantly in boot camp. We teach them the definition of no, and we teach them the definition of right now. And he said those are the two things that parents have not taught their children typically. The definition of no, they don't know that no means no. That we have to set boundaries on our behavior and what we do, and they don't know what right now means. And right now doesn't mean a second from now. It means right now, like instantly react. And it was interesting to hear a general's perspective on what they're trying to do from a strategic standpoint in boot camp. And that, that was his commentary, is that we teach recruits what right now means. 
well, that's what the Marine Corps is known for. And, and uh, any well done uh, uh, film uh, of, of the Marine Corps training certainly portrays that. Um, it must be a challenge uh, bringing these youngsters in from uh, the American culture into boot camp these days, more so than ever. What do you think? Oh, well, we've got, uh, we've got guys that are drill sergeants up at Fort Leonard Wood that come and shoot at our range, and uh, the level of frustration they express on the, on the, the uh, skills and abilities and attitudes of the current crop of recruits is tragic almost. It's, 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 they, just, they just shake their head. They don't know what to do with them. I mean, it's just tough. It would be tough. It would definitely be tough. And uh, God bless them for what they are attempting to do. Uh, is there a very high washout rate for uh, recruits these days? Do you know? You know, I don't. I don't know. I know the standards have become very lax, and, and so uh, you're not allowed to be super tough on recruits these days. And there's different rules about how you can discipline them. You know, with uh, with negative feedback and exercise, and it's just not it's just not what it used to be. You know, it's it's just uh, it's a much softer military. Let's just put it that way. Well, you're being polite, but uh, they have actually recently in the last year or so increased the uh, physical fitness testing, uh, and, and it has become tougher. And that's that's a good sign. That's a real good sign. Um, we got about an hour break coming up here, and we should uh, have our master's moment uh, when we get back from the break, shouldn't we? Absolutely. I've got a good one ready for you guys. Okay. I'm looking forward to it. I'm learning a lot. I know our listeners are learning a lot also. And uh, when we get back from the break, we will have the master's moment and a long segment. We've got, we've got a lot of, of things to cover in this long segment. And, um, yes, encouraging people to improve their skill sets. That's what we do. That's our mantra. We need people to improve their skill sets and, of course, along the way, improve their equipment and be able to pass that along to others and make it a generational thing. That's just something that happens one time and it's over. Uh, a lot of things we're trying to accomplish here, aren't we, Sam? Yeah, it's not complicated, thanks, but we're going to talk about Chuck Mawini. I'll see you on the other side of the break. Okay, we have a break. We'll be right back. You are tuned in to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Visit our website by going to republicbroadcasting.org. Tired of being lied to by mass media? It's growing more and more apparent today that news is received less and less through standard media outlets. Even with a growing audience every day, RBN is beginning to direct more efforts into social media. Social media and the use of the Internet is fast becoming the primary source of people for news, regardless of demographic. RBN has set out to provide some of the best news on the Internet through republicbroadcasting.org and also has begun to use the tools to our advantage by way of social media. Republic Broadcasting is now operating a Facebook page to function as yet another avenue to have our collective voice reach new audiences across not only America, but across the globe as well. The Facebook page features not only news, but also an RBN player to listen to our broadcast. Get involved by visiting Facebook.com slash Republic Broadcasting and liking our page and share it with your friends and family because you can handle the truth. We're back to J.R. Moore here on Monday, the 23rd of December. My website is thelibertyman.com. Check it out. We've got some discretionary time the next two weeks between now and New Year's. Lots there. Excellent articles, great videos, and so forth at thelibertyman.com. Visiting with Sam Andrews, the proprietor of Freedom Center USA. Facebook page is Freedom Center USA. And we're about to have our master's moment. Let's go, Sam. Well, today I picked uh, Chuck Mulaney. 
as the master to talk about. Chuck was a Marine Corps scout sniper. He was the he was a famous guy that didn't start out famous. He didn't even tell his wife or anyone that he worked as a sniper in the military. He was he was born in a town called Lakeview, Oregon, back in 1949. He was a gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps. Uh, he started out uh, as a rifleman uh, to Lima Company, 1st Battalion, 5th Marines. And, and uh, he was an interesting guy because he was so humble and so went about his job so quietly uh, that no one had any idea the level of effectiveness that he had on the on the battlefield. And there was a there was a gentleman who wrote a book, a fellow sniper, uh, that that had wrote a book and mentioned Bowinney and his 101 confirmed kills. And at the time the book came out, it was extremely controversial because people were on the Carlos Hathcock bandwagon with 95 kills, and they thought, oh, you know, Carlos is the greatest sniper in history, and Carlos was an excellent, effective sniper and one of the best we've ever had, particularly in the field craft area. But for a guy to come out and claim that somebody had more kills than Carlos Hathcock, that was a controversial thing. Well, a bunch of research was done, and it turns out that uh, uh, Mr. Mawinney had, um, I think, 103 was the final determination. And there's an Army sniper named Adelbert Waldron that actually held the record at the time with 109. Of course, those records have been obliterated, you know, in the, in the latest uh, two wars over in the Middle East. But back in the day, you know, in a jungle-type environment, that's, that was a tremendous number of kills. And uh, I think eventually Chuck's total was considered to be 103 confirmed and 216 additional probables. So uh, he was a very, very accomplished marksman. And uh, I got to meet him briefly at the World Sniper Championships in 2000 at Ben Avery Range. Chuck was the match director. And uh, during one of the mover evolutions, the guy running that evolution was Neil Morris, who'd been an instructor at the three different Marine sniper schools and at the time was probably the oldest active Marine sniper in the Marine Corps. Uh, he looked at my target to score it, and he called Chuck over to look at it. And Chuck walked over and looked at it, and there was a crowd around. I couldn't really get that close, but I heard Mr. Mawinney say, you know, that is that is really top-notch shooting, and he walked away to look at some of the other targets. Uh, but he was a very, very humble man. And I remember the last evolution of the competition where we had to run a mile with our gear in eight minutes, climb to the top of the tower, identify four targets at unknown range, and shoot them. That was the exercise. And there was a CIA guy uh, in there with, a, uh, with an Army uh, CAG operator, and they were a team. You're supposed to stay within 15 feet of your team, made at all times. And this CAG operator came flying down the road. He had dust coming off his boots. He was in the top of the tower in less than five minutes. And he killed all the targets in like four seconds. Well, he shot one in the forehead, one in the face, one in the throat, and one in the chest. And in the exercise, you only got credit for the targets that cover the shots that hit the eye and nose area. And at the end of the competition, Chuck Mawinney, as the match director, would always ask, does anyone have anything to add after the team that scored the highest gave their brief on how they did in the match? Chuck would simply ask, does anyone else have anything to add? Well, all week, all four days, nobody would say anything. And uh, in on the last exercise, this CAG operator stood up. He said, I got something to say. That last exercise was BS. And uh, uh, Chuck said as calmly as he could, well, please, sir, tell us what you're thinking. <laughs> you know, everybody was like, oh, my gosh, here we go. Right, this is going right, to be ugly. Right. And... Uh, and this operator stood up and he said, I've been in combat and I, I, I've been in these situations and, and, you know, these guys are climbing to the top of the tower and they're ranging one target and they're shooting it. And then, and then 15 seconds later, they're ranging another target and they're shooting it. He goes, that's BS. And he didn't use the word BS. He used the whole phrase. But um, he said, that's just BS. He goes, in the real world, you take that first shot. 
you got about three seconds to do all the killing you're going to do because those targets are going to disappear. And literally in unison, 200 snipers stood up and gave the guy a standing ovation. There, uh, that's a great story. There was a uh, sniper with the Finnish army in <coughs> Finland, World War II, Simo Heha, credited with uh, shooting more than 500 Soviet troops. <coughs> Um, they call him White Death, the White Death. <coughs> well, Chuck was a, Chuck was a humble, yeah, Chuck was a humble guy. When this guy stood up and and complained, Chuck, you know, just I couldn't believe how calm and relaxed he was, and 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 how he handled the situation. But to me, it spoke to his inner strength as a man. And these guys that have this experience, like this Finnish sniper, I mean, they're tremendous human beings. Well, every every, every war since uh, World War One, we start beginning the war with uh, no core of trained snipers. I think the, the, the current wars in Afghanistan and Iraq were exceptions. Finally, the military decided to start a war and actually have a core of trained snipers to begin the war with, didn't they? Yeah, we have, you know, I don't want to give out exact numbers, but we have uh, hundreds and hundreds of snipers, trained snipers in the Marine Corps, and thousands in the Army, and hundreds in the Navy. And, uh, you know, I really don't know how many we have in the Air Force, but uh, there's a few in the Air Force as well for security reasons. And uh, it, it just... Uh, they're very, very effective force multipliers on the battlefield. They can literally shape the battlefield, and that's a great thing. It is a great thing. It is a great thing, and, and hopefully this uh, uh, will continue uh, indefinitely for all the military services that they maintain a core of uh, trained snipers ready to defend liberty and defend freedom whenever, the, whenever it comes up. Well, when I, when I was at the Pentagon in 2002, right after 9-11, there was a strategic initiative to double the number of special forces and to double the number of snipers that were trained and ready. So I know the challenge was put out there. I think the problem is, do we have the demographics? Can you find enough guys that have talent in those areas to fill that type of increase? And, you know, I don't know the answer. I haven't been involved in the last few years, so I'm not sure. Well, you got your, uh, you have your own sources, and, and uh, apparently, the best I can tell, it is continuing, and it really needs to. Um, taking these city boys and turning them into snipers, that would be a challenge. It is, it is a challenge to take someone who's grown up in an urban environment and turn him into a sniper. That the easiest transition to a, an active military sniper is a guy who's done a lot of bow hunting grown up on a ranch or a farm, and he has some high math aptitude, those guys take to the advanced levels of sniping like like a duck to water. But, uh, you know, you have to have some basic material to work with, and I just don't know if there's enough men cut out to do that type of job. Hard to say. It's hard to say. Um, uh, yeah, the bow hunters have uh, unique skill sets when it comes to field craft especially. Uh, the field craft is probably more difficult to learn than the marksmanship. What do you think? I would agree with that with everything except the wind reading. The fundamentals of marksmanship, uh, everyone can learn if they put the time in. Uh, where you see the men separated from the boys is their ability to read the wind. That's probably the most difficult thing you do. And then from a field craft standpoint, the exfil is always the most difficult part of your mission, uh, almost always. So, you know, making a, a good wind call and getting out alive is kind of the kind of the two elements that you focus on. Absolutely, absolutely, that is, that is uh, what they focus on. And I, I've done dozens and dozens of infiltrations and exfiltrations myself uh, in the private sector. And uh, the more you do it, the better you get at it. That's true of most things, isn't it? Yes, uh, if, as long as you've trained in the right techniques, uh, these skills are perishable. You do have to do it, and you have to do it a lot if you want to be really good at it. 
in the, it, just like the El Presidente drill we did at a rifle class in nearby Burnham, Missouri. I mean, you saw the difference between the beginning of the day and the end of the day from a training, you know, the speed at which people could engage targets. Once you push them, shown them the right techniques, given them a few rounds of practice, it makes a big difference. It makes a huge difference. It makes a massive difference. And uh, you know, what we're talking about right now is uh, hopefully going to encourage people to understand these skills can be acquired, uh, that they are doable. It's, it's not something that is extremely difficult. Yeah, it's going to take some time, a little bit of money, maybe a little bit of travel. But once you got the skills, uh, the basic skill sets, you can improve them on your own, can't you? Yes. Once you get a direction to train in and get the right type of exercises to work on, you can be as good as you want to be. It just depends on how much time do you want to put in. And desire. If people want it, they can do it, right? Yeah, and what I'm afraid of is that there's a lot of people that have been putting this off, uh, getting prepared for what's coming in this country. They're putting it off. They're procrastinating. And I would encourage you to break all those barriers down and stop procrastinating because we're running out of time. My biggest fear is that guys put this off until the last possible moment. Then they can't get ammo. There is no time to train. It's We're just in an ugly situation, and, and that's... That's my biggest concern for this country. And, you know, the men out there that bring bolt rifles to tactical matches, you know, that think a box and a half of ammo is plenty of ammo for civil unrest, you guys are you guys are in for a very painful lesson if you don't get your act together. Well, painful and possibly deadly. Yeah, it's, we, have a, we have this uh, two-edged sword in our culture you know, these men that like to shoot and like to hunt, they're independent guys. And they like being independent. They like the freedom of being in the woods alone, and that's great. But you know what? To defend your community, <clears throat> you you need to come together as a group of men. You need to communicate. You need to get along. You need to put the ego in the closet and lock the door. You, you need to talk to your neighbors and, and, and get to know your neighbors and, and come up with a strategy or your community, you can't defend you and you can't defend your family if you don't have people in your community that will work as a team. You can't defend anything 24-7, 365 by yourself. Because you need to sleep and you need to eat. You need to shower. You need to do, do hygiene maintenance. And all those things take time, and they take you out of a defensive posture. And the only way to defend anything long-term is to have a community working together as a team. That's right. That's right. Uh, I, I, a lady friend of mine, she asked me uh, about how safe she thought she would be. She has her five acres, beautiful lake, nice home, by herself, her and her cats. And she asked me if she'd be okay safe. And I, I asked her, well, how long can you stay awake? That was my response. How long can you stay awake? Um, so, uh, think people think they can go it on their own. Uh, that's a massive mistake, isn't it? It's a massive mistake because you, you know there's two myths out there that that, that really bother me, and the, the one is what you're alluded to there is I can I can defend myself. Well, it's a myth. The answer is yeah, you can defend yourself for as long as you can stay awake. And the other myth out there is. I can shoot a PRS match or a most tactical match that really isn't tactical, and I can develop my rifle skills. Well, no, you're learning how to do everything wrong. You're given a minute and a half to take take four shots at two different targets. That's an eternity in a firefight. You don't get a minute and a half in the real world, okay? And so you have all this time to set up and to get steady and to throw your big pillow bag on a barricade you know, all this type of stuff, and you got a minute and a half to dial your scope, dial your windage correction, you know, and it's just, I'm just, I'm, I mean, my teeth gritting at that point. 
It's like I would have killed 20 people in the time it took you to pull your scope cover off and dial your scope. For God's sake, learn to shoot. Get on the gun and kill the enemy. And, you know, it, it just, it's, it's two different ways of looking at things. And, and if you've been in a firefight, you understand what I'm saying. If you haven't been in a firefight, you can throw down the Visa card, buy the tactical rifle, and pretend you're tactical. The problem is none of that stuff works in the real world. You know, if you can't get in your scope and range something passively and quickly and kill it in less than 10 seconds, you're doing a lot of things wrong. You know, you have a choice. You can die with your fingers on your elevation turret, or you can live with your finger on the trigger. Make the right choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. Make the right choice and do it now. Ladies and gentlemen, these 11 months, less than 11 months, they will fly by. It will make your head spin how fast these 11 months are, will go on one hand. On the other, we have right now time to get some good training, get some good equipment, get some practice in, so that if the need arises to defend liberty, defend innocent life, defend property, you have the skills, you have the equipment, you've had the practice, and it will make things go a lot better, won't it, Absolutely. You know, I call the I call these young guys with their phone apps and their first focal plane mill dot scopes. We call them mill monkeys. You know, it takes them it takes them forty five seconds to range a target and kill it. It takes a guy trained properly on my system about four seconds, five seconds to passively range a target and kill it. Now, do you want to break a shot in forty five seconds, or do you want to break a shot in four seconds? Make the choice. How good do you want to be? You know, and, and I've got a standing offer for $10,000 for anybody that can range five targets at five different sizes at five different ranges faster than I can with an MOA reticle in my system. I got a $10,000 offer. Anybody wants yeah. to take me up on it? You think your mill scope and your first focal plane scope is a tool to have in a fight? Come take the money. It's easy money for you, Ten grand. That's quite an offer. We got a break. We'll be right back. All right, we are back. This is on Jared Moore here on Monday, the twenty third of December. This is Farmers Monday. Visiting with Sam Andrews, the proprietor of Freedom Center USA. The telephone number down there is 417-718-2597. Well, Sam, we're down to the last uh, three minutes here. Uh, what do you want to leave these folks with this week? Well, I get a lot of criticism from the mill monkeys on, on my comments about what the right tools are to fight with. But if you're bringing a bolt gun and mill dots to, to, to a civil unrest situation, you're just not going to be as effective as a guy with a minute of angle reticle and second focal plane with a semi-auto weapon system. You're just not. And it's the truth. And I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm not trying to be a pompous ass. But the truth is, I got $10,000 out there. If you think you can outperform me with your bolt gun and your mill dot scope, in unknown range scenarios, which is real world in, 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 in a fight, then come take my money. Buy yourself a new jet ski. You know, the truth matters. And, and the real reason I do that is to get the truth out, is that people understand what really works. And, you know, the good guys have to win. And the reason the good guys normally win is because they're objective and they tell the truth and they think logically and intelligently. And that's why the good guys win and the bad guys lose. Because evil messes up the mind. It makes you make bad decisions. So if you stick to the truth, you make good decisions. And, and that's why we do these things. So, you know, it's in the interest of promoting a secure America and a, a, a system that allows us to, to preserve freedom. And that's why I want guys to look at these things and make a determination about what works ahead of time. Well, that's good, and that's quite an offer. I know you're standing behind it, and uh, uh, I know the outcome. If anybody took you up, took up, took you up on the challenge, they would just flat lose. Um, but uh, sometimes it takes that kind of competition to uh, reinforce reality, doesn't it? it? It really does, and and you know all of these guys that 
promote the marketing people and the shooters that have made these decisions to buy first focal plane mill dot scopes, they all promote themselves as tactical shooters and tactically proficient, and I use the best tool, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? In the real world, it doesn't pan out that way. And none of them want to take me up on the offer because they know they're going to get waxed and they're going to lose their money. But uh, if the offer's out there, anybody's feeling froggy, come on down to the Freedom Center and we'll work it out. So they need to put their ten grand on the table, and you put your ten on the grant table, and then it's off to the races, isn't it? Yeah, let's see what's up. Let's see what happens <laughs> in the real world. That's about as real as it gets. <laughs> well, the, the only way you can be realer, you know, is is I saw Mark Karachi take a smart ass kid at Oak Ridge on the firing line one day, He's, and and he was arguing with Mark about how to do something in a tactical sniper situation. And Mark said, listen, you little punk, you take your rifle down to a 1,000 yards and you throw down prone. When this guy drops the, the white towel, I'll throw down prone and we'll see who, who kills who first. That's about the only thing you can get more real. And, of course, the kid didn't want to take Mark up on the offer because he knew his chances weren't very good. Smart young man. Sam, thank you, sir. Merry Christmas. We'll be back next Monday. Hey, Merry Christmas, John. Let freedom ring. Take care, buddy. Absolutely. That's a